All right, it's September 26, 2014. I'm Sue Cohen, Ellie Stewart, and Brenda Kyle with the San Marcos Heritage Association. Today, we are so excited to interview H.C. Kyle III and Dudley Doby Jr., who both grew up in San Marcos on San Antonio Street, and we can't wait to hear what they tell us about that. H.C., tell us a little bit about your family and your family home and your... Okay. <clears throat> My full name, Henry Carter Kyle III, Dad, uh, same name as you might deduct from uh, my name. Um, Dad was a lawyer, practiced here, gosh, 63 years, I think. Mom was a, a housewife. She taught school for a few years when I was real young at San Marcos Academy. She was an art teacher, and we went to school there for my sister and I for uh, four years and during grade school. I had one sister, Elizabeth Pitts. She's married now, lives in Kentucky. Mom and dad are both deceased. Uh, we lived in grandma's house, which was at 626 West San Antonio Street until I was seven, when mom and dad bought this house where we are right now, at 711 West San Antonio Street, where we've lived, uh, or where we lived until I went off to school. And when dad died, in 98, well, soon after that, we moved into this house uh, on San Antonio Street. Um, been very comfortable here. We love San Antonio Street, love our neighbors. And uh, that's, <clears throat> oh, I'm also a lawyer. Um, practiced with Dad for 35, 40 years. Um, and that's about it. Great. Dudley, you want to tell us about your family? Indeed. Uh, I'm Dudley Richard Doby Jr. Uh, my parents uh, were students at uh, Southwest Texas State Normal School, or college as it was called then. I fell in love, didn't want to leave San Marcos. My, my mother uh, grew up here in San Marcos. She was Deborah Galbraith Doby, uh, and uh, she really didn't want to leave San Marcos after they married. They both became teachers, and I think their first teaching assignment was at Westover School here in San Marcos. Um, I was born in 1939, my parents had just built their home at 801 West San Antonio Street uh, the year before I was born. So uh, I knew that home uh, all of my uh, childhood, nearby here to the, the Kyle home. And uh, I, I have to say, H.C., it's wonderful to be back in this this beautiful home. Well, oh, thank you. Uh, H.C.'s mother was, uh, well, I, I love both uh, Mr. and Mrs. Kyle. Mrs. Kyle was our scout den mother for quite a while, and I have great memories of being in this house. You know, I don't period. remember that. <laughs> I remember We've, that uh, Buck Shibe's mother, Beanie Shibe, was our den mother, but I don't remember Mama. Where she were was. the meetings? Well, we had, you lived upstairs at the time, and yes. I think the Fields mm -hmm. of Field Furniture yes. Company lived downstairs. Yes, yes so did. we had a couple of meetings in your living room upstairs, and then I remember meetings under this grape arbor right out in the front side yard. Well, isn't that something? And in fact, uh, I remember a meeting on the front porch <laughs> of the, the Kyle home right across the street here. Uh-huh. Uh, but anyway, I digress. Daddy, are you sure you didn't make that? I <laughs> <laughs> uh, in any event, uh, I, I uh, uh, went on fr through the public schools here in San Marcos um, went to uh, college at the University of Texas at, at Austin and uh, uh, was a chemical engineer for a while and then went to law school at, at UT 
uh, and at that point, H.C. had been in the Navy for a while. I had been in Houston uh, working as an engineer for a while, and so we wound up as classmates in, in law school. And uh, should add that we've both been practicing 50 years now um, and were uh, privileged to have been part of a, a celebration of 50-year lawyers uh, just this summer at, a, at the uh, Texas Bar Association, the State Bar annual meeting in, in Austin. But I'm still practicing law uh, in, in Austin with uh, two law partners. The firm is Brarby, Crozier, and Doby. And um, uh, Cesar will get a kick out of this. I, I plan on working uh, until somebody puts an end to my misery. And, uh, I think HC probably feels the same way. When my secretary quit. <laughs> yeah, right. Now, your dad had a printing business in your home there on San Antonio Street? No, he did not. I did. Oh. That's um, your printing, Chris. It, yes. Uh, I, for, my dad bought a, a whole printing plant, a, a platen press type, etc., from a bookstore in Austin that went out of business and had the printing plant. And during World War II, he had it moved over to the garage at our home. And I played with it and uh, taught myself how to, how to use it. So I uh, had a part-time business doing <clears throat> commercial printing, uh, particularly in high school years. I did not know that. I did. <laughs> I always thought it was your dad that had the printing business. Wow. No, no. So how has San Antonio Street changed over the years? Oh, just a little bit. <laughs> oh, goodness. The start with the change that Brenda and I don't like a whole lot, and that is there are more and more college students that live along here, more and more cars parked along the street. Uh, but we certainly improved our real estate. Yeah. Uh, the yards look better, the houses look better. Uh, we have air conditioning. Mm -hmm. As kids, we didn't have air conditioning, of course. Incidentally, there was a fellow that lived right behind, well, in your garage apartment, behind your house, behind by the name of... Home. By the name of Klett. Klett, do you? Yes. What was his first name? Well, uh, the, the uh, son who was your and my age uh, was Temple Klett. Temple. Good, good. Because that was right across the street from you. R right. Yeah, he, I think he was here just for a real short time. His mother yes. was in school after his dad died. She had to go to work teaching. Yes. Uh, there have been lots of changes, golly. It's all running around back there in the wilderness behind the house well when i mean there was a we, lot of w plant space before all these houses got built around for y'all to yeah, play we moved into this house in 1943 and there was an old barn uh -huh. a two-story barn with hayloft and uh the the house was built by my great-grandfather ivy rylander and, and his wife glenny and they had a, a smokehouse a carpenter shop chicken coop and another shop back there. Uh, and we had fun playing back there. Golly. Uh, we'd get up in that loft and uh, somebody would be in there and somebody would lob big firecrackers through the windows and just scare the dickens out of whoever was there. I'm sure your grandfather uh, loved you doing uh, matches around the barn. Well, yeah. <laughs> I think Dudley was smoking back there one time and caught the hay on fire. <laughs> you remember that, Dudley? I, I remember H.C. and I would regularly smoke grapevine back there, and we were all one of us was always on the lookout for his father because we, we we were terrified we'd be caught. 
I don't remember setting anything on fire, although I, I, I was disciplined as a child for playing with matches. I remember that very well. Yeah. Somebody did. I was just teasing about that, but somebody did uh, start a fire back there, and I know it was a kid smoking <laughs> in the barn. Uh, but those grapevines, they smoked pretty well. They did. They had to be dry, <laughs> though. They had, to, they had to be real dry, right. about that big around, and uh, made pretty good smoke, but hot. But we were pretty good at, at selecting just the right length and yeah. diameter and age of the, yeah. of the vine. It, uh, it, uh, do you remember uh, playing with little toy soldiers in a sandbox that we had right here behind that? The absolutely. That, uh, uh, we couldn't afford sand at our house, so I loved playing in the <laughs> sandbox. <laughs> You were you were talking about things that changed. Uh -huh. Back then, we didn't have Little League. We didn't have organized sports in the summertime. So we had to make do with what we could do. And there were, oh, I don't know, four, five, six lots down here behind where your house is. Okay. On uh, then Comal Street, now MLK, uh, where we cleared the, the land off. There were just, they had called them Roosevelt Widows, uh, uh, Willows, uh, and some other trees and put down some bases and played baseball. Well, Dunbar School, which was Caddy Carnet across the street, was we call the colored school. And they had a playground covered with gravel. They kind of sloped down to a creek. And you hit a ball on that thing. And if you didn't get to it, you know, you'd have to go several hundred yards to get that ball down in the creek bottom. Well, they came over one summer and asked if they couldn't play with us. And so, oh, sure, you, you organize a team and we'll play you. Well, we played against them and it didn't take long to discover that was no match. They were so much better than we were. And so about we mixed up. How old were you all then? Pardon? How about how old were you guys then? Oh, sixth grade, seventh okay. grade, something like that. And uh, we mixed up the teams and had real competitive games and had fun. Uh, we enjoyed them. There were, oh, just some real fine guys, I thought. But y'all didn't go to school with them because of no, segregation. we were still segregated then. And this was about the only contact that, well, there was, we had a yardman who had a, had a grandson that, that he would bring sometime when he would work in the yard. And I knew him, Norris his name was. But these were the only colored boys that, that I knew. Might probably the same for you, Dudley. It, it, it was. Uh, H.C. was a, a gifted athlete, and, and I was not. So I've spent most of the time on the, on the bench, although we didn't have an actual bench there. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and then I was also assigned to, to shag balls. Uh, you know, uh, Buzzy and Austin Barber lived uh, between you and me, and their lot backed up to our baseball lot. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And so whenever the, the black fellows would hit a ball, it typically would go in the barber's backyard and then I was assigned to go shag those balls. <laughs> that was my contribution oh. to the, But the you game. know, some of those guys that I thought were just, I'm thinking two or three, really fine, fine athletes. Uh, who, if they had come along a few years later, would have gotten great scholarships, and I know they'd have done well in college sports, had terrible, terrible lives. They were just awful. Alcoholics. Uh, one of them, well, two of them, were grandsons of, I believe, of Dora Brady. You might have known Dora. They lived with her, and I think they were her grandsons. Uh, but I, I sure admired their athletic ability and I liked them. They were just good people. That's one of the things that makes San Antonio Street interesting. When I first moved on to San Antonio Street, they said the people that worked in the homes lived one block away on the street behind. And it has yeah. changed so much over the years that urban renewal, you know, the streets behind have changed more almost than this street. Like I said, we lived with my grandmother until I was seven. Mm -hmm. 
And I remember <clears throat> it was my job once a week to take my grandmother's laundry to a colored lady who lived down on Comal Street. She had a little cart that she had put the laundry in, or I'd put the laundry in and take down there. Ella was her name. And when I would take it back, it always smelled of uh, the lamps that she used uh, or the heating oil that, that she used. Well, there was a hotel behind your house. Remember that hotel that was on the corner of Endicott and... And Kamal? And it, it, was, it, it, it was... It was a that, hotel of sorts. It, it was a, a rental, more of a rental property uh, and... Uh, Vic, Vicky, Miss Vicky, Queen Victoria, as as she was affectionately called, owned the first house there on the corner that you just described, and then gradually bought property that backed up to our house at 801 West San Antonio Street, and. Uh, very enterprising entrepreneurial lady who began as a maid and then was able to save uh, some money as, as she uh, 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 was able to and, and acquired property. Between her house and our house uh, were a couple, and I, I cannot remember their last name, um, Van and Luella. Van was Victoria's brother, as I recall, and um, all, all of them were like family, even though there was segregation, which we're all ashamed of today. Uh, it was a great, great neighborhood. Everyone really cared about each other, and uh, I, I miss those kinds of years. That's one thing that has really changed. I, well, and I've heard y'all talk about there was no air conditioning, so <clears throat> people sat on their porches and you could hear people inside their homes. You talk about the girls that lived across the street. I've heard you talk mm -hmm. about the pretty girls. Oh, the Meek family <laughs> lived directly across the street at the corner of, it, it was would be the northwest quadrant of the intersection of Endicott and West San Antonio. And the Meeks had, I think, seven or eight daughters. <clears throat> and one of them, the, the youngest, uh, who always caught my attention, uh, I think her name was Merle, but she was a regular Marilyn Monroe. Just a beautiful, she, beautiful girl. She the one that married the contractor? Uh, but we. We bought a house with him one time, and he fixed it up and in 1985. We sold it just in time. But uh, what's his name? Oh, I don't know. Baker. Baker, Barnett Baker. What was Barnett's wife's name? Gail. Gail. Okay, this is a different one. But it was one of it was one of those mixed girls uh, married yeah. Bar a fellow named Barnett Baker, uh, who built a lot of houses around here. Are y'all talking about the house that? Home yeah, it was, yes. It was the Meeks family that sold it to the Weatherfords for the funeral home? I think that's right. They turned yes. it into the funeral home, right? It, uh -huh. That's that's right. And I want to Was mention, it a funeral home when you lived there no, as a kid? No, no. I want to mention the next door neighbor to the Meeks. So it would be the next house west. The uh, dentist? Dr. M.C. Williams, he was a wonderful medical doctor, uh, had practiced here in San Marcos forever, and had an office, I think, above Hilburn Pharmacy down on the square. Hmm. And he would see his uh, Anglo patients down at his office, and you could almost set your your watch by it. About four o'clock in the afternoon, he would come home having seen patients all day, and cars were lined up in front of his home, black and Hispanic patients that he saw pro bono. So 
he would work into the evening hours and I, I don't know what he ever did for relaxation because all he ever did was practice medicine. But one of the real heroes of, of San Marcos in those early years. How interesting. Do you remember when that house burned? I do. Uh, and, in, fire. and in fact, it was being painted and I think Austin Barber and I were playing out in the front yard of our house. The painters had stored all of their paint. Well, you can go ahead and tell that story. The statute of limitations is long. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I know my father probably thought I had something to do with that, but it, for once there, I also. did not. But they had stored all of their paint and rags and so on under the front porch. It was a frame house. And I saw flames erupt over there and I didn't understand spontaneous combustion at the time, but that's obviously what it was with gasoline soaked rags. Yeah. And so I ran inside told my mother about it and she called the fire department and they came and, and put it out. It did a little damage though to the house. Dad was a fireman back then, a volunteer fireman, and I believe the way it worked, I don't know how they got the word out, but I, I think they would sound some kind of alarm and then the volunteer fireman would call in and find out where the fire was. And then they would go fight the fire. And Dad let me go to this fire since it was so close to our home in the middle of the night. I remember that terrible fire. But it's been rebuilt. It's a nice house now. I like, like the way it looks. Uh, do you remember, Dudley, the theater, I think it had been used as a theater, which was on the right uh, about the second hundred block of San Antonio Street. Um, just a big old green wooden building uh, that you'd pass by every time you'd walk to town. Just the other side of the telephone company. Well, I remember the telephone company well. I don't remember that theater. Do you remember the old Hayes Theater on the oh, west yeah. side of oh, yeah. the square? And I remember how fascinating it was for a kid to sit and watch the Coke bottles oh, coming, yeah. in, coming around yeah. that belt. Yeah. In the, Feltner the, Feltner bottle, the Feltner Bottling Company. company. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they let, as kids, you could go up and down. There was no worries back then. Y'all, how far mm -hmm. did you range? What was your roaming range as kids? Well, we would go down to the river every summer, uh, get on our bicycles with our fishing poles and, and bathing suits, and we'd just spend the day. Okay. We didn't take our lunch with us. I don't, yeah, we did sometimes. And we'd fish, and then we'd swim, and we'd catch, oh, a string of fish about this long. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> It would be a string of fish that long. That's not one fish. Not a one of them would be any longer than that. But loving mothers would cook even those little bitty perch, and they were good. See, we could roam all over town, and and parents didn't work. All the kids did. That's what people don't realize. Yeah. Yeah. And every I remember back in where I lived that each parent had a bell that they would ring, and you knew what your ring was at dark, and you had to get home for supper and. That's the yes. only rule. You had to be back when your belt, your, whatever your signal was that your mother let y'all know it was time to come home for right. supper. Right. Mama had a little goat bell okay. about that big that she would ring. Had a very distinct sound. And we knew what to do when we heard that. Uh, up here where Loop Street is, there were no houses up there. I think the McCutcheon house was about a block from the top of the hill. There's some kids named McCutcheon who lived there. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we'd go up there and trap for varmints. Never caught a thing. <laughs> we set out lots of traps. <laughs> and we, we'd go up there with bows and arrows trying to kill varmints and never got a one. But it sure was exciting. Well, we caught maybe one or two. 
<laughs> varmints in a trap, but not much. <laughs> Bert and Blevins. You remember them? Bert and Blevins were yeah. the McCutcheon twins. Uh huh. Really characters. Yeah. They lived up near Loop Street. Yeah. Uh, and Channing Williams. Uh huh. Lived just the outskirts of town then, wasn't it? It, it was, yeah. That's yes, the uh, house right across from the tar buttons now. You know it, where my yeah. right. lived? Uh-huh. Right. It's right yeah. at the top of Scott Street. Uh-huh. Correct. And I can remember when they uh, paved Scott Street for the first time. And I remember being fascinated by the grader that would grade that uh, gravel back and forth and finally put the hot stuff on it. Uh, remember... Uh, particularly uh, colored folk who would uh, drive wagons pulled by a mule or a horse or a donkey. You remember a fellow named Poochum? I do. <laughs> right. Uh, I think he was one of those drivers. Uh, not quite right in the head. Picked up garbage, didn't he? Yeah. Yep. I think that's what it was. For his hogs. And he, he, he wasn't quite right, but you know, there's something about the human spirit that you can respect uh, in a guy like that. He kept plugging. He came uh, by in a wagon and picked up he, your garbage? Uh -huh. he, he did. We, I remember my parents would put uh, uh, the uh, leftovers from meals and cooking in a big five-gallon bucket that had a handle on it. Slot bucket. And slot bucket and there was a huge nail in uh, one of those large sycamore trees near the street along Endicott Street and he would come by in his wagon at any time of day or night and take that bucket and put it in his uh, his bin and fed his hogs. Uh -huh. and speaking of paving I remember my first paving experience down here on Endicott Street. Uh, the the first owner of the the now the Cohen home at Endicott and San Antonio Street. First owner I remember was Earl and Bess McGee. He was the mayor. He was mayor of San Marcos. And is he the one that signed his name like that? A series yes. of straight lines? Yes. yes. Okay, go ahead. Well, I didn't remember ever seeing his, his well, name. Well, <laughs> you didn't see as many documents in the courthouse. Well, I'm sure either. you've seen them. No wonder. <laughs> right. But anyway, they sold to the Bowdens. And Mr. Bowden was a road contractor. I had forgotten that. And Endicott was a, a gravel, mud street at the time, and the, the city uh, of San Marcos had such a tight budget that they, they didn't want to pave you know, a side street that uh, didn't really help that many people. So Mr. Bowden paved Endicott Street from San Antonio Street down to Camal and even beyond Camal down to the turn in, in the road there. I had heard that, that the first time it was paved was by Mr. Bowden. And did it gratis. Yes, yeah. that would never happen today. That wouldn't happen at all today. Now did either one of your parents, did your dad walk to town to go to work? Walk oftentimes, to the post office? I've heard that he did, he did. Uh -huh. yes. Sometimes he would take the car to town and walk home. And mom would say, where's the car? <laughs> <laughs> he didn't do that often. Once or twice he did. And she wouldn't let him forget it. Yeah. Did he so. come home for lunch? Yeah. Yes. Of course. And I, I can remember more than once talking to a lawyer in Austin or San Antonio or some big city like that. And say, well, I got to go now. It's time for lunch. I got to go home. What? <laughs> they were just they could be amazed that a person could go home and have lunch with his family. And it's uh, not bad. Two, three minutes to get to work. I think that's what makes San Antonio Street so unique. It is like a block from the downtown of the county seat and 
Mm -hmm. As kids, y'all probably were so close to everything going on. Even if you weren't old enough to go hang out at the movie theaters and stuff, you could still... Uh Oh, let me tell you a a story that... It was... uh, Dudley, I don't know whether you were one of uh, those that went down there or not, but one spring, a lot of weeds grew up in Purgatory Creek. I mean, tall weeds, of course, maybe not as tall as I think now, but to us little kids, they were real tall weeds. And the water had washed out some holes down there, and we could go through those weeds and find those holes that might have four or five feet of water, and we skinny dipped right in the middle of Purgatory Creek. Uh, And we thought we were just, you know, breaking the worst of all possible taboos when we did that. Answer your your question. No, I never did that. I I always chose the river, which is much more powerful. Well, but you don't have that feeling of adventure. That we felt. And and the river back then, golly. Rio Vista Park was an incredible place. It was. Goodness sakes. Uh, trolley, the big old trolley, 20, 25 feet high. Ride that thing down into the water and a big old top to play on. Gee. No worries about liability. Right. If you hurt yourself, you just put a Band-Aid on and kept yeah. going. I've got scars all over the top of my head where I've hit the bottom of that river. I think H.C. was one of the the fellows uh, that uh, that down at Rio Vista Park, uh, and I don't know whether it's still there. I, I suspect it is still there. The railroad trestle ran right right through Rio Vista Park, and it was great sport for the daredevils. Uh, I was not one. (laughs) (laughs) There were too many threats. (laughs) Whenever uh, they'd hear the whistle of a train in the distance, they'd climb out of the river, run around to the end of the trestle, go up, get, they got on the trestle just above the river, and the last guy to jump in the river before the engine got there was the hero. And I doubt that that happens anymore. But it, it was fun to watch. I, I, uh, Neither one of you will admit doing it? No, 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 no I never no. did. It. Even though statute of <laughs> limitations have run. Uh-uh. No, I was not. But there were so many other things. We played tag for hours, it seemed like. Were there lots of kids on this street in this neighborhood? Like lots of young kids like y'all? There were several. Uh, guys not too far from my age. Austin and Buzzy, Robert Baker over here, you and I. Down just a little bit, Joel Client, right. David Daly. David was a little older and he didn't play with as much. Joel didn't either because he was a little bit further away. But every now and then they would come down. You remember playing guns? Oh, absolutely. And absolutely. Yeah. we would play like we were shooting at each other, and we'd have teams. And if I were this close to you and came up behind you and they went bang, well, it was pretty clear that I had gotten you. But if you were out there maybe as far as the street, not clear at all. And I think that's where Dudley and I first learned to argue about, <laughs> <laughs> about <laughs> about who got shot when. Because, you know, we didn't have paint that we could shoot each other with. It was just an argument. And, uh, yeah, on down and the street, what there else? was George Dykus. Remember Butsy Dykus? Yes. Butsy was his yes. name. Well, I, and, I never did interact with them. Uh, oh, and behind. Uh, the, the Baker home, and I think before it was known as the Baker home, it was known as the Hurd home. True. And uh, Mr. Hurd was a, a plumber. Mm-hmm. And I think the Hurd family sold to the Bakers and then built a garage apartment behind the Baker home. But you remember Sammy Hurd? Yes, I do. Talk about a character. Sammy. Um, 
was a person that if he were walking down the sidewalk here on San Antonio Street, uh, you would cross the street to get onto the sidewalk on the other side. Uh, he cut a wide swath. And Sammy did a little time. I, 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 I didn't want to <laughs> make a point of that, he but he did. Mm -hmm. He was a couple of years older. Uh -huh. uh, he, he, for example, would intimidate us with firecracker guns. It'd be more like a bomb now, but he, <laughs> he had a piece of pipe with a wood handle screwed to it. It was open at one end and closed at the other end, and he'd, he'd load a firecracker in there and run the fuse of the firecracker up through a little hole and then put a little pebble or something down in it. Light that firecracker and if he pointed that thing at you, you put some distance <laughs> <laughs> between us. And uh, just, tor just tormented the life out of people. And, and where did he live? He lived behind the- Dr. Smith's house. Baker home over here. It, uh, I think the, the Smiths have yeah, acquired yeah. that yes. tract. But they lived in a little house back there and the, uh, their access was along the same driveway that mom and dad used when we lived over there at grandmother's house. Well, there were lots of big houses, but then there were also a lot of little apart garage apartments uh -huh. throughout this neighborhood as well. Uh, right? I remember his younger sister running home <laughs> when we lived over there in grandmother's house and she was holding herself and she, she said, I've got ants in my pants. I've got ants in my pants. <laughs> Virginia was her name. Uh, How old was she when this happened? She was same, I, I was seven or younger oh, and she was the same age I was. And uh, now, did y'all ever do any pranks like that with the firecracker gun? Anything like that, like Halloween pranks or anything y'all no. did in the neighborhood? I I remember when we were in high school, we were in a car and throwing out firecrackers, and somebody had rolled up a window that somebody else didn't know had been rolled up, and he tried to throw a fire. It was one of these <laughs> one of these cherry bombs. These things are about that long. Tried to throw it out. <laughs> It didn't go out, and you talk about a hot potato. <laughs> it went around the car, and it ended up in my lap right there. It went off in my lap, and I had a big old white oh. spot on my cheese. You had to explain that to your mom. Oh, they, <laughs> it was okay. I mean, San Marcos uh, was a small town, so it probably got back to your parents, anything that went on. Oh, I think I told them. It wasn't that big a deal. <laughs> but do you remember Roger Hurd's... Uh, Old car? I do. Wasn't that a Model A? Yeah, I think it was. He was yeah. a plumber. And yeah. Went around in old Model A. Yeah, yeah. Had all his tools in the rumble seat in back. Yeah. Well, just going on up the street, uh, in the next block uh, east of here was Norman Parker Yarbrough, although uh -huh. they, they redid that house later, I think. Uh, and then on up from them was Helen Posey. Remember uh, Posey's uh, tea room up there? Yeah, uh, that wasn't Helen, though. Helen. That wasn't Helen, is Helen. the pretty one. I mean, the gorgeous one. Uh, and But those were some pretty girls, too. Well, they were. <laughs> they were. They were. Oh, they was were. that their That's home great. and they had a tea room in the bottom? Yes. 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 Julia's as well, didn't it? Julia. Julia's tea room. It's a it's Julia a boarding Posey. house now, kind of. Uh, but was not it? A it was house, a tea room, and and they lived upstairs. Or tell me about that. No, they lived behind. They rented out the upstairs because Sonny Gregg and his family lived upstairs. No, they. Years. I think they lived over here in Grandma's old house. Well, they did for a while, but then they moved up there to the Posies. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't know that. So you're talking about Julia Posey? Julia oh, Posey. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's still the Posey house. So what, the tea room was like a lunch place? It or was, a tea? yes. 
I think uh, Kiwanis Club met there at one time, okay. maybe Rotary that's, Club that's did, right. I'm not sure. They did. Um, wow. It was a funeral home at one time. Well, it was. A.B. Rogers Funeral Home. A long time ago. Way before y'all were kids. I think so. I don't, yeah, that's right, I don't remember it being that. So was it but funeral it was. home before it became the tea room? Uh-huh. That's a nice thought. Were there any other businesses on this street? <laughs> Not right. that I can recall. Well, just up from the tea room later in, well, probably in beginning in the 50s was um, Williams Flower Shop. Remember Mr. Williams who taught yeah. uh, taught us in high school? Uh huh. He and his family had a flower shop <laughs> just a block up from Julia's Tea Room. On San Antonio, on San Antonio Street. Street. It's where um, Floyd McKenzie where lives. Yes. Where that <laughs> crazy <laughs> place is. Yeah, the crazy place. <laughs> <laughs> now, did Mr. Yarbrough teach y'all in high school? He was he principal. Was your, he was the he principal, was principal when y'all were in high school? Right. And he, so he lived on your street. Right. Wasn't that the Jackman house? Yeah. That it, it yes. was, we called it a haunted house. It yes. was really a wreck. Yes, it was. Uh, and the Yarbras bought it, probably spent a lot of money back then redoing it, and it became a beautiful house. It, uh, we would go over there. People would, you know, back in the late 30s, early 40s, there were still hobos going from door to door asking for a meal and people would spend the night in that house and we'd go over there and uh, we'd see evidence of people and sometimes we'd hear noises just scared us to death. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, speaking it, of... It was uh, definitely a haunted house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was and, and speaking of, of uh, the, the war years and hobos, San Antonio Street was the San Antonio, original San Antonio Highway between Austin and San Antonio. And during World War II, uh, hobos used San Antonio Street as a thoroughfare. Um, and I'm sure you've all heard of the marks that hobos would use, and they did it on San Antonio Street. Uh, th they would knock on the door and, and ask for a meal, and when the, the homeowner would feed them, then they would put a certain mark out on the curb so other hobos would know that that was a friendly place to stop. And, San Marcos Street, I'll bet, was the most generous street in the state of Texas to hobos. Yeah. Hobos really loved this street. I'd never heard of the mark. Uh, yeah. Sadly. Yeah. And I remember many a one would sit on the, the back. They never came in the front door. So your mom and would they, feed the hobos? Yes, they would come to the back door, and mother or grandmother would uh, give them a meal. Yeah, mine, mine would too. We'd feed them on the front porch of, of our house. They would. But grandmother was kind of an old school. I mean, she would tell them to go to the back door, and that's where she would, where she would feed them. Now, another family close by H.C. was the Vernon Cooks. Yes. Vernon yes. was a long-time dentist here in uh -huh. San Marcos, and just a house or two off of San Antonio Street on mm -hmm. the street. Blanco, Blanco, Blanco street, street, thank you. Uh -huh. uh, and they backed up to the herds and bakers, I think. Uh, and Rita Cook Anderson, Anderson. Uh -huh. was our age, uh, more your age. <laughs> yeah, but, but uh, uh, and then I didn't give my age a while ago. I'm just one year older than he. <laughs> he said you were two years older. That's really just one. Just fourteen, 14 months, but fourteen. Older. Oh, yeah, that's. Now, did y'all walk? Y'all went to the old Lamar school. Where did you go to elementary school? 
when y'all lived here when you were kids? Up on the yeah. college campus in the, the what's, what's called the education building where, so Evans, where Evans Auditorium. Evans Auditorium. So y'all didn't go to the Lamar School, or is that was junior high? School? Well, that was that starting uh, when I was in the ninth. I went to, to the ninth grade up here on the hill. And in the 10th grade, I started high school at what is now Lamar okay. and finished there. And Dudley did the same thing, I guess. Right. right. Oh, the, uh, when I was in the ninth grade, I was in the band. And the band hall was an old frame house at the intersection, well, right there across from Evans Auditorium. And we, our, the band met on the second story and down on the first floor was a cafeteria. The only school cafeteria was in this little old house. And a Mrs. DeStagger, who I think lived in the DeStagger up here, that's called the Doll House now, mm -hmm. up on Hopkins Street, uh, worked down there. I think she was in charge of it. And she would save leftover gingerbread from the day before for us. And we'd go ahead by and have a big old piece of gingerbread every time we'd go up to uh, the band, which was two or three times. So a week. it was a cafeteria for the college or for y'all? No, the for, the, for, kids? The, for the for the uh, public school. Public kids. school. Uh -huh. And when you Back were little then, kids, did you walk up the, all that way to school? How'd you get to no. school? Speaking of that, wasn't there a Galbraith that had a confection store on North LBJ, just half a block from school? He's he, was that he, your mother's he, family? Yeah, he, he's setting up a, okay. a nice Good. scenario Good. here for me. That, yeah, that was my mother's family. Okay, was uh, there was there a Galbraith that ran uh, Rive Vista Park? Was there was there a name Galbraith? Now, if there if there was, I didn't know that Galbraith. Okay, well, I, but, I I wanted to ask that question yeah. before, and uh, just reminded me the the. Uh, <clears throat> the house with the, uh, the the cafeteria and the band hall uh -huh. was, if you think of the college campus now having a mall from Old Main over to what is now the new library building, on that mall, it was just the other side of the mall from Evans Auditorium, if you and I are talking about the same, same old house. Just like uh, this was 75 just... yards from Evans Auditorium, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. But on this side. Is that the confectionery oh. you're talking about? Oh, well, no, the confectionery, my, my grandfather, William Francis Galbraith, um, bought property on North Austin, now LBJ, and I think that the building that sits there now is Laurel Hall, or it was Laurel Hall. I don't know whether Laurel Hall is still there. And uh, he made sandwiches, all kinds of pastries and candies, and had a, a sandwich uh, bar there. And in fact, that's where my father met my mother the first time, because my mother lived they, they lived in the back of that or alongside it. Yeah. And the Manskys later bought that and moved the Mansky uh, operation a few blocks down toward the square. But the old Mansky roll mm -hmm. was an original Galbraith recipe. Is that right? Yeah. How about that? They yeah. still make those. Mansky rolls. Do Somebody it? does. Huh. And they call them Mansky rolls. Mm -hmm. They copyrighted it. How about that? You should have been around then to uh, work your patent magic. <laughs> 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 you know, I want to mention a character. Um, this is a little bit west of San Antonio Street, but not far. Harvey Street is a short street that is one of the five streets that intersect between San Antonio and Hopkins, uh, just two mm -hmm. blocks up here. There was another haunted house on Harvey Street. I don't know whether you remember that. 
Uh, yes. Was it where? Uh, it's across from McBride Wilson's house. Yeah, yeah. There was an old guy who ran for the Justice of the Peace All right. every year. That, that's where I'm headed. But you go ahead and, and yeah. His name was Edwin Wallace. That's it. And that began with W. And he. He ran for office 19 times. And I, uh, I remember, he had a big old like 1930s Buick, black four-door sedan, and he'd drive around town. He had speakers on it and he had a, a sign down the top of the car, Waller for president or whatever office he was running for at the time. And on Sunday, he'd park it in front of the Methodist church. And then after the Method, the Baptists were always later getting out than the Methodists were. So after the Methodists got out, he'd drive down and park in front of the Baptist church. And he never did win? Uh, no, I don't think he ever won any office, but he ran and ran and ran for <laughs> office. But uh, something that would be a great history project would be to trace his lineage I would bet that he was descended from Edwin Waller who laid out the city of Austin uh, when it became the capital of Texas. You know, Edwin, uh, Edwin Waller quite was... Quite possible. He had uh, politics in his blood. <laughs> he lived on Harvey Street? He lived on Harvey Street, mm -hmm. next to the old haunted house, whatever that house yeah. was. Is the well, house still there where he lived or is it... I kind of think it is. So the Harvey Street house, the haunted house, had hobos in it too? I don't know. I, yeah. I, I think uh, the house I'm thinking about was the one that Waller lived in. And we, there was just something about that house that kind of drew us. And, and we would go up and do mean things that kids would do at that house. I asked y'all earlier if you did any of that stuff, and you said you didn't. Well, I never did. Well, I know that you must have. I, well, oh, there's <laughs> yeah. You know, anytime you end a statement like that, things that kids do, it can't be too bad, can it? No, I think it was probably marvelous being a kid on this street back then. It was. We were very fortunate. St. Mark's was a wonderful place to grow up. And that's why we want to record this for future oh, generations. Really? That kids today are locked in their air-conditioned houses playing on their gangs. They don't understand oh. how you mm. guys ran the streets. And you probably went down, it your was, parents probably sent you down to the grocery store to pick up milk and oh. stuff on your bicycles, maybe? Did it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Did. yeah. To the post office oh. to get the mail. Well, we had milk delivered to the door then. Oh. Yeah. So did you, you know have that? To do that. <laughs> Yeah, we'd, you know, early in the morning for breakfast, we'd go out and to the front of the, step, of the stoop there, the front stoop, pick up our milk. And you put oh. the glass bottles back out. That's right. My grandmother's house in Austin had a place where the ice delivery into the kitchen. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this house has that, but, you know. It did. A door you can where see, the ice went in. You can see in the kitchen where the nails uh, were in the floor back there, the ice man could bring the ice in, put it in the in the ice box, and then leave, and really not enter coming, the house. Not yet, not uh, coming in the house. Yeah. And and who was one of the men that delivered the ice to this house? Her grandfather. Uh, was, Is that was a fact? Nice what was who was she that? She think uh, Barney Lawrence. Yeah, William Barney Lawrence. I'll be. He was in the ice business. And no, he just worked as the <coughs> delivery man after he married. And and drove the ice wagon, and he would come to the back door and never allowed to come in, of course. You know, you weren't allowed to go in. you just open that door and put your ice, big hunks of ice down and then leave. Mm -hmm. And he worked there for not a real long time because my grandmother was jealous and made him quit because he got to go to all those houses and see all those women. <laughs> <laughs> so he worked out of the old ice house where the falls right. are at, right. at uh, right. Dudley Spring Which Lake. reminds me. <laughs> Do you remember a colored lady who played the piano and sang at uh, a place over in Austin when we were in law school? And it's one of the songs that she sang was Any Ice Today Ladies. I do not remember. You don't? Well, <laughs> no. Ver, no, she, she made the front page of the Austin American when she died. She was that much of a 
prominent figure Isn't in the name Margaret something? I'm thinking it began with a B. Bernie, Bertha, something like that. I remember Willie Nelson down at Dirty's on the drag. I never did see Willie Nelson. Never saw Willie. Well, you know, no. you, you Rice graduates were above probably. <laughs> well, you, if you'd heard right. this gal, you wouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> She was uh, any ice today, lady. But you know, uh, you talked about uh, riding bikes down the Rio Vista and swimming in the river, and uh, and we'd swim up at Sewell Park and at, at uh, City Park, where the American Legion Hall was, uh -huh. and then uh, we would detour around by the ice house and the delivery dock. Uh, was just the right height. You could ride right up to it. And they were always chipping those huge blocks of ice and those chips would fly off and we'd grab the chips and uh, and uh, suck on them all the way home on a real hot summer day. Now, that was wow. a, a great experience. And then we'd go play tennis sometimes in the tennis courts <laughs> over there until we'd see Coach Jowers coming. <laughs> <laughs> And y'all weren't supposed to be on the college tennis courts? Uh-uh. No. Okay. They were locked. We have to crawl over these real high <laughs> pitches. <laughs> and it's hard to get over those very fast when Jairus is coming. You need to talk about Wallace Barber and his father, Will Barber. Didn't Wallace live next, to you, next door to you all right here? Well, no, no, you're thinking of Ernest Morgan. Ernest Morgan did, yeah. But, Ernest uh, lived over there. He was the United States Attorney for that's number right. of years in the Johnson Ford. administration. But the story I wanted to tell okay. about Wallace, Dad said that Wallace didn't learn how to talk, or at least for anybody but the family could understand him, until he was about 10. They took him all over the country, his parents did. Finally found somebody in Cincinnati uh, that could help him talk, where he could be understood. And even as an old man, he, he talk differently, but he's a very good lawyer, very good. His dad, probably when he died, owned about as much land in Hayes County as anybody did, but he owed money on it. Uh, we had a depression here in the 20s, long before the National Depression, simply because it was so dry. And agriculture had a tough time for, oh, 15, 20 years. Well, uh, one of the debts was to a man whose estate that I handled, who died in 1977. Tom Johnson died in 1977. He had been a partner of old man Will G. Barber. There was a Will G. Barber, who very prominent lawyer in Austin, by the name of Will G., who was Mr. O.G., who was old man Will G. Barber's nephew. So that's why they called him Old Man Will G to distinguish between the two. Well, he had given Tom a note for about 2500 I think it was. And Wallace kept that estate open. Wallace died in about, about the same year that uh, Tom did, in 1977, and the estate was finally settled in 1979, and Tom's estate was, note, was paid off, even though the statute of limitations had run in about 1940, $20,000, with all the interest that accumulated all those years, and all the debts were paid. That was the last debt. Wallace had kept that estate open for 43 years until those debts were paid. He was district attorney when I knew him, and he had a thriving practice in addition to that. He worked an 80-hour week. When he died, he had a moderate estate. I'm not familiar with his estate, particularly I think Bruce Waits, a lawyer in Austin, had handled that, but I handled his wife's estate when she died a few years later. And it was a modest, a modest estate. So Wallace kept it open to pay his debts. Wallace kept it open all those years to pay his father's debts. 
Tell us about that today. I did not know that wow. until I had a conversation over the telephone with Virginia O'Brien, his secretary for many, many years, uh, soon after the note was paid off. And she told me uh, about how Wallace was determined to honor the memory of his father. Wow, that's quite a story. I wanted that recorded. That's good. I've tried great, great story. To, I've tried to interest a couple of uh, local writers in the story unsuccessfully. Yeah. You know, there were some wonderful lawyers here in, in San Marcos. I know your, your father was a huge influence on you, but my parents being school teachers uh, did not encourage me at all to go in, into law. Uh, but when I decided that I wanted to, I know I was influenced by your father, by Wallace Barber, Ernest Morgan, Terry Jacks, Charles Ramsey. Um, just a, an amazing number of, yeah. of uh, very prominent, outstanding lawyers here in in San Marcos. When I started practice, I believe I was the sixth lawyer in San Marcos. There must be 60 now. That's yeah. amazing. Mm -hmm. What was your father's address of his law office? That's a great story. <laughs> well, his <coughs> office was uh, uh, 118 North Austin Street. Uh, until they changed it to LBJ. And then he changed his address to east side of Courthouse Square. And uh, Dollahite, who had a shoe store, changed his address to a post office box. And Alex Kirchhoff, who had a Pontiac dealership at the intersection of then Colorado Street and Austin Street, changed his address to Colorado Street from Austin Street. Your dad wouldn't even say LBJ Street. No. <laughs> Needless to say, he was a Republican. Well, well, I think your dad was always a, what, your dad was chairman of the Democratic, uh, Hayes County Democratic Party, I think. He was he? for a number of years and was a yellow dog Democrat. Yeah. But in 1964, when LBJ uh, ran for for president, um, my father stayed home. He did not go to the polls that day to vote. He had interacted with LBJ in their college years, yeah. and LBJ had um, probably, I'll use the word influence, had influenced some student elections at the college. And my father, who was on the same debate team with LBJ, I don't know whether LBJ won more debates than my father did or, or what, but my father would never vote for LBJ. And I think even though he was a Democrat, if he had had an office on, on South Austin Street, he, he would have changed the name <laughs> of his address also. You know, I didn't vote in that election either. <laughs> I couldn't bring myself to vote for either man. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, that's the only presidential election that I've been eligible to vote in that I didn't vote. He ran against Goldwater, if right. you yeah. didn't recall. I, I had read Goldwater's, and we digress from San Antonio. It, well, it doesn't have to be all San Antonio. It's just that time, <clears throat> yeah. point in time. Y'all yeah. are doing great. You can digress. Yeah. I, I had in law school, read Goldwater's book, Conscience of a Conservative, and was really taken with his philosophy. And uh, so in April 1964, when I, and I moved to Houston, and uh, I went to work for Fulbright and Jaworski, uh, I wore a Goldwater button in the office and Leon Jaworski was LBJ's personal lawyer. And the first day I wore that button to the office, my supervising partner said, <clears throat> Dudley, 
you know, <laughs> you have every right to be what of whatever political persuasion you wish, but if you want to have a future here in this law firm, you probably should not wear that to the office. So I took it off, put it in my pocket, never wore it again, <clears throat> and then became a Democrat. <laughs> well, uh, another LBJ story, local story. Uh, I uh, needed to make up Rotary Club in Seguin, and High Price here, who had the telephone company, member of Rotary, and he, I realized, had missed the same meeting that I had, so I called him and asked him if I could give him a ride, and I did, and on the way over, we got to talking about the telephone company. Uh, my aunt, Meaty, dad's sister, married a Donaldson. Well, the Donaldsons uh, owned the telephone company when I bought it, and I mentioned that fact, and I knew what he paid for it, which <laughs> was just almost nothing. Well, he uh, told the story about how uh, a certain gentleman, now here's when the lawyer needs to think ahead a little bit. Uh, Watch what you say. <laughs> <laughs> it's on tape. <laughs> he, uh, he, he said that a certain gentleman was, was city attorney at that time and had pretty, uh, pretty much control over I've, over the commissioners. I don't think they were a city council then. I'm pretty sure they were not. It was a commission form of It was, yeah. Mayor and two commissioners. A yeah. commission form of government. And he had pretty, pretty complete control. And he, he had his eye on acquiring the telephone company, at least for himself or someone else. And he had been able to block the increases in fares that the telephone company had to have in order to pay their people what they had to have in order to work for them. And the Donaldsons got to the point where they had to sell, he said. And uh, This was H.Y. Price that yes, blocked the... Yes. Okay. No, it was this person who had a great influence over the commissioner's court, okay. or no, whatever they call it, the <laughs> city commissioners. Uh, and one day... Well, he had hired a fellow by the name of Charles Herring, who later became head of LCRA, uh, who was also Lyndon Johnson's lawyer, to go in and talk to this gentleman. And uh, uh, this gentleman was a big fan of, of LBJ's, and he assumed that Charles Herring was representing LBJ, and that LBJ wanted to acquire this telephone company. And so he just laid the red carpet out for him to purchase the telephone company and I had no difficulty at all. So that is the way that came down. And then they, the, the Price family sold that to Verizon or whom? Century. 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 Century Tell that later become, became Century Link. Uh, for, and the price has got 36 million. Do you remember what your for, phone numbers were? At this house when you were a kid, what was your phone number? Ours was 101. <laughs> Is that right? I don't remember ours. I mean, just, yeah. I, can I have an old phone book from that time and it was. The only reason I can remember that, it was uh, because our street number was 801. And so 101 wasn't all that different, just one digit off. There was that. one question that was asked long ago by Sue that neither one of you addressed that before we go any further or wrap this up, that I think we need to answer, and that is, how did you get to school in elementary school and high school? Did you walk, ride your bicycles? Park? Well, she to high school, you. I walked. It was just a couple of blocks, and Dudley probably did too, didn't right. he? That's what right. it was at Lamar. But, but Elementary good. school, y'all went all the way up to the up university. Up to the, the college campus in the Evans Auditorium building, and H.C., there was a big old yellow school bus, an old, old, probably 1930s yellow school bus that would come down San Antonio mm -hmm. Street and we'd go down to the Arnold's mm -hmm. 
side yard and play in that big oak tree and wait on the bus. And then it would circle around and go up Hutchison, I think, and then up to the campus. Yeah, our bus stop was right across the street. Uh, and, and incidentally, this needs to be noted historically. None of us appreciated it at the time, but uh, in certainly in elementary school and, and, and for the most part in junior high school, our teachers were ladies, were women. And typically, they were spouses of co uh, professors at the college. Highly educated, very talented. We probably had the best education that any public school in the state of Texas could provide a student because of those wonderful teachers. And because the university you, wouldn't hire the women. Women... <laughs> Of yeah. course, That's had right. glass ceilings yeah. back yeah. then. Yeah. Women have become so mm. uppity now. <laughs> they're, they're, Watch it. they're going into law. You they're going the into engineer. medicine. They're I going know. even into engineering. I know. Well, I've got a I've got involved. a client who's a contractor. You are involved. <laughs> a, a female contractor. Yeah, yeah. They do everything in the world, and you know, the result is we don't have such top quality. That we oh. had at one time. Oh. I'm talking about no. I'm talking about in the, in the in in school. In school. Oh, in I thought teachers. you were talking about a class. No, 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 no. It's probably more. It's probably better now than it ever has been because of the women. That is yeah. in the profession. Yeah. So but, many. Uh, in, now, when y'all were in high school, was it integrated by the time you got to high school? No. So you, when you, what no. year did you graduate from high school? Fifty-five and fifty-six. 56. And San Marcos was integrated in the sixties. I think so. Not long afterward. Yeah, it wasn't long there. Did either one of you play sports in high school? I played football. Yeah. And I tried out for basketball and baseball, <laughs> track, but the football is the only thing I let her do. He was an all district center. Yeah. Football. Yeah. So, yeah, a know. great football player. Yeah, but I, I wanted to play f baseball more than anything, but I was not a good baseball player. It's a lot of fun. And it's so much more fun when you get a bunch of kids together, Dudley, like we did, and played down there on that lot. Yeah. That was so much more fun. That's my favorite I think. part of what y'all have told us today was your baseball games back there. I can just yeah. picture it. Oh, it was a great time. And it Dudley was, retrieving yeah. the balls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, Dudley, you have a great story about going to the bank when you were young. Uh, I'm probably talking about one of the Kyle's uh, old clients, but uh, speaking of, of being able to roam all around town, I had a weekly um, uh, oh, uh, budget or what do you, what do you, allowance. allowance, thank you, senior moment, of a nickel. And there was a model shop model airplanes and the like next door to First National Bank on the square between your law office and the bank mm -hmm. building. Mm -hmm. And I would go down on Saturday mornings. I could either spend that nickel and go to a movie or I could go buy a model. And so one morning I walked into the model shop and the model I wanted was a dime and I only had a nickel. My father banked over at First State Bank, cat a corner across the square. But First National Bank was so convenient there next door, and I was about five years old, I guess. I walked into First National Bank, went up to the teller's window, and said, I need a nickel. <laughs> and, and this stern, to me, a stern looking lady said, son, we don't give away money. And I said, well, my father goes to the bank over here, First State Bank, and they give away money to him. I've been over there with him. And, and she said, son, please, please get out of here. And so I came home dejected. And it was oh. years later that First National Bank went bankrupt, 
And I cheered and cheered and cheered. Oh. <laughs> they Weren't they a client of yours? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I thought they were a yeah. client. Yeah. Sorry about the that, bankruptcy. That's, that's good. That's good. Well, that, Any the, other questions, anybody? I'd like to mention okay. one other thing. Okay, good. Uh, King Feed Company was down uh -huh. at the corner of San Antonio Street and Guadalupe Street yeah. when I was a kid. Okay? And Ross King's father, um, I forgot. Clarence. Henry King. Henry King. Henry King. No, was it Henry? Was it Clarence? Clarence, Clarence King. Clarence, Clarence King. King. That's it. Thank you. Uh, Clarence. Owned the business at the time. And I wanted to raise chickens. And Dad said I couldn't raise them in the yard. And so I got a chicken brooder, which is an outfit about this high. And you have several layers where you run your chickens in and you move them from this layer to this layer as they get bigger and that sort of thing. And I remember bought a chicken brooder for $28 and some odd cents on credit. Uh -oh. And I paid him every week that I sold chickens until I paid that thing off. Oh. Uh, that was my first business endeavor. And why didn't your father want you to do that? He didn't want me to put them in the yard. Oh. <laughs> Messy. That is. Uh, <laughs> But I, but I, he said, if I got a brooder, that that then would work. Then you could do it. I don't know if people use those things anymore or not. But, and boy, that was the best chicken. Golly. <laughs> I sold them around the neighborhood, mostly to my mother. And I could get, <laughs> and I could, I could get $2 a piece for them. Can you imagine for a chicken? And that was, well, I remember when, uh, uh, Fried chicken it was, you know, that was the delicacy at our house. Oh, I think man. chicken must have been a whole lot more expensive relative <clears throat> to the cost of meat then, uh, the cost of beef. Did you have it every Sunday or was it a special occasion? On special Sundays we special did. Special Sundays. Yeah. Boy, it was good. Still like it. 